So hopefully these considerations and examples motivate this definition that we will call the outer measure, right? So M star is going to be known as the outer measure. And again, it is a function from the power set of the reals into the uh, non-negative extended real numbers. And, uh, and it will be the infimum over all of the overestimates of A, right? So we saw how, uh, you know, in the set of all overestimates, because they were overestimates, we wanted to keep getting smaller and smaller and get as small as we could possibly get it without going, you know, below, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the measure of the set, basically. Uh, so, um, right, just, just to, you know, sort of remind you, what does that mean, right? What are the overestimates of A? Again, we take an open, a countable open interval cover of A, and we sum all the lengths. So we're taking the infimum over all of these sums, and that is the definition of M star of A. I do want to point out that uh, notice that every single one of these lengths, because of the constraints on what a countable open interval cover of A is, these lengths are all strictly positive. And therefore, the overestimates are strictly positive. And one thing that that tells us is that zero is always a lower bound on the set of overestimates, right? And it's never an element of the set, but it's always a lower bound on the set. And that will occasionally be useful, especially when m star of some set is equal to zero. So, uh, now just kind of a quick chatty note about why do we call this outer measure? I mean, to some extent, it's kind of obvious because we are, you know, sort of um, going outside in, right? Like as we get these uh, covers of A and we imagine them shrinking down to A, that's kind of uh, uh, approximating them from the outside down to a tight fit around the set. Um, does the fact that this is called an outer measure imply that there's an inner measure? Yes, it does. You can measure these things inside out. We won't talk about those just because, you know, these, <laughs> this is going to be a long sequence as it is. And so I just omit them to try to cut down on just how much I cover. Um, also, another reason why we might call this the outer measure is because at a certain point, right, we're not in a position to do it right now, but eventually we're going to define a general measure. And we will wonder whether or not M star technically qualifies as a measure. And uh, as a bit of a forbidding note, well, we qualify it by saying it's close to a measure, but it is not quite a measure. So it's an outer measure. Right, a little bit of a qualification on it, uh, whether or not it is a measure. Now, let's go ahead and have an exercise in a theorem and computing M star. In particular, let's return to the example of uh, any countable subset of the real numbers let's argue that m star of a is equal to zero. Seems like maybe we've already done that, but we haven't fully because uh, and effectively the argument that we've already given is that m star of a is less than or equal to zero. Okay, fine, the other part of it, right, the only thing that's missing is extremely trivial, so in a sense it's already done, but uh, you know, we do want to make sure that m star of a is greater than or equal to zero, but because of a comment earlier, zero is always a lower bound on any set of estimates, so that certainly is true. And based on the work that we've done earlier, we know that no positive number can be a, uh, a, a, uh, lower bound on the set of estimates, right? Because effectively that limit argument from the family, the parameterized family of uh, open intervals shows that if you pick any positive number, there will always be some 
uh, open interval cover, namely one of, one of the ones in the family that we made, uh, such that the overestimate corresponding to that uh, interval cover will be less than epsilon, so epsilon is not a lower bound on the set of overestimates, right? So, so, um, so whatever the greatest lower bound is, it's a lower bound, and it can't, right, by that argument, it can't be a positive number, so it's less than or equal to zero. Put these two together, and you have that m star of a is equal to zero. Okay, now we're going to do a bit of a harder proof, and this is going to be the proof that m star gets intervals right. Now, what do I mean by intervals right? I mean that it says that if you take any interval, whether it is open, closed, half open, you name it, if it's bounded, then it gives the interval length, and if it's unbounded, then it says infinity. Now, to get started, which interval, what kind of interval should we consider? Well, you might guess bounded, and that's a good guess. You might, as I initially did, guess, why not, open intervals. So much of what we've done and what we've defined has been in terms of open intervals. But uh, you try it for a bit and you find that it's actually really hard. Uh, and, there's an, and there's a way around the hardness, which is namely to not go for open intervals. Why not? Well, when I say it, it'll become, it'll, it'll feel as if you should have known all along if you don't already, which is Closed intervals, especially the bounded ones. Those are closed and bounded sets of real numbers, and therefore they're compact. And compactness, we know, interacts nicely with open interval covers, which is, after all, uh, one of the sort of constituents of the definition of M star. So that is, in fact, a very, way, very good way to go. Okay. So we'll get into the proof. Now, to begin with, I'm actually not going to show every write the proof for every possible interval a to b. I'll just show it for zero to one. Uh, the generalization to any possible interval a to b should be an almost identical proof, right? So really, the generalization is barely different from the proof for this specific case. Um, also notice that our work from earlier showed that uh, the m star must well, for this interval must be less than or equal to one, right? By the same kind of argument that I gave when we discussed countable sets, right? If you took any number bigger than one from our limit argument earlier, that number, whatever is bigger than one, cannot be a lower bound on the set of overestimates because one of our sets would have an overestimate which is smaller. Than that number. So uh, m star must be less than or equal to 1. Okay, now we have to show the reverse inequality. And uh, whenever you're trying to show that something is less than or equal to an infimum, then you can always write one strategy is to show that that thing is a lower bound on the same set, right? The set that over which you're taking the infimum. So, uh, so let's show that 1 is a lower bound on the set of all overestimates, right? Um, uh, since since uh, m star is the greatest lower bound, then if 1 is a lower bound, then m star must be greater than or equal to that lower bound. Okay, as we discussed before, 0 to 1 closed is a compact set, and therefore with this, um, with any chosen open interval cover, there must exist some finite subcover, so we'll call it i sub j sub k, k running from 1 to n, so there will be n of these things. Now, rather than directly showing that this overestimate is greater than 1, um, let's make a fictitious assumption that I will repair shortly, right? So as an oversimplification, Let's imagine that the intervals run end to end, right? So the very first one will go from A1 to B1, so let's kind of diagram it like this, capturing the number 0, and uh, ending at B1, and the next interval will pick up right where the first one left off. So its starting end will be B1. 
and run to B2 where it ends, but the next one begins at exactly that point and so on until we cover one at which point we end. Now, um, this is absolutely a fictional example because we know that no open interval cover is like this because this does not cover the points B1, B2, and B3. So this is not the kind of thing that we're talking about, but I promise repairing, right, it's not far from it, so repairing it will be easy. But if it were like this, then let's look at the sum over the interval lengths. You would get a telescoping sum. That's why I wanted to do it this way, is if you take the length of the first interval, which is the difference of the endpoints, you would get that. And then this one, you would get that, and so on until the very last one, you would get that. But the B1 and the minus B1 would cancel, and the B2 and a later minus B2 would cancel, and so on. This negative Bn minus 1 would cancel. And the only things that don't cancel in the, in the telescoping sum is this final term Bn and this initial uh, minus A1. So it simplifies down to this. Now, we want to argue that this is greater than 1. Well, uh, from the diagram, or you could argue the, you know, some interval must contain zero, and we're calling it I sub J sub 1, uh, A1 has to be less than zero. And by a similar argument, Bn has to be greater than 1. And therefore, Bn minus A1 is greater than 1. So now, having established, you know, right, and obviously that would entail that since 1 is less than this thing, right, Bn minus A1, uh, and that is the same thing as this uh, overestimate of the set, and that is less than the initial choice of the overestimate, then, right, we grabbed an arbitrary overestimate and found that it's greater than 1. That would be the argument. But before that can be the argument, we have to repair the sort of deliberate mistakes that we've made. But how do you repair it? Well. Um, for one thing, you know, obviously these intervals are going to overlap, right? That's the only way you're not going to miss any points is if these things have overlap. And what that means is that, you know, okay, fine, the first interval is still going to run from some A1 to some B1. That's not going to change. But the second interval is going to run from an A2 to B2 where A2 is to the left of B1, right? I mean, that's how it's going to capture B1 and therefore, you know, right, that it has to do that in order to capture all the points in the interval. So when this is actually A2, we're going to know that A2 is, you know, less than B1. And so down here, when you rewrite the sum, you know, rather than uh, writing it with a B1 right here, you'd be writing it with an A2. Um, maybe I'll just carry that minus with it, right? And, um, and now, you know, rather than put a B1 together with a negative B1, you'd be putting a B1 together with a negative A2, where A2 is, again, smaller than B1, making this not zero, but a positive quantity. So in fact, all that does, right, rather than those being zero and, you know, getting an equality because those cancel, instead, these would be positive quantities that were dropping out, and this would turn into a greater than rather than an equality. But that hurts nothing at all because this argument stays the same. This is still greater than one. And so we would know that, th that one is less than this quantity is less than this quantity doesn't hurt the argument at all now that we've repaired it. Now, by the way, you might also wonder, how do we know that we can necessarily sequence the intervals in a, right, like, you know, um, how do we know that this one is going to be the one that contains zero and so on? Well, okay, the, you know, it's kind of obvious, but if you want the somewhat professional way of it, you know, sort of proving that this can always be done, that some sequencing must exist. You can say, well, look, I write it by assumption is an open interval cover, right, or is a cover of the set. So, um, so some one of these uh, uh, open intervals in the cover must contain zero. So let's just call it A1 to B1. And now some, right, B1 is in the set or it's not. If it's not in the set, you're already done. 
if it is in the set, right, from zero to one, then that makes it a point inside the set, and so there must exist some other interval containing B1, so we'll call it the second interval. And keep going, and you know that in finite time, right, after choosing a finite number of these intervals, you must eventually cover the number one because this is a finite set covering the whole interval. That's kind of the quick version of the sort of mathematician's argument for that fact. And so make those repairs to this argument and proof complete. Okay, so to carry on with the rest of the proof, we want to prove that uh, M star gets every other kind of interval right, so that could be like open or half open or uh, any other kind of interval. And of course, you know, as we usually do, if we've got one victory for a simpler case, we'd like to exploit it to uh, try to, you know, sort of make it do work for, for the rest of the cases. And so a natural thought about what we could try from here is to take any other arbitrary interval um, and bounded interval, and it'll have uh, endpoints A less than B, right? And maybe we can somehow sort of like, uh, you know, relate it to a closed interval. Well, I mean, obviously, if we take the closed interval from A to B, that's going to contain any other interval. And that's a little suggestive because that makes it sort of uh, natural to wonder if by simply being a subset, does that uh, imply that M star uh, assigns this no greater uh, measure, which would be, you know, right, the, you, you would think it would, right? Um, and if it did, it would give you half of what we're trying to do, right? Because we are trying to show that I has measure b minus a, right, the difference of its endpoints. So if we, could, if we could reason like this, then it would give us this inequality with b minus a, and that would be half of what we want. So let's investigate this, right? Now, this whole idea that if a is a subset of b, then m star of a is, a, is less than or equal to m star of b, is called monotonicity, and it is one of the most important principles that we will get for this M star, uh, you know, uh, I would say that, you know, in just about every uh, proof that we give, <clears throat> that we give, um, we will use monotonicity somewhere between one and two times, uh, you know, putting the, <laughs> the ratio of theorems to use of monotonicity close to one to one. So that makes this, you know, a very important theorem, and so we should prove it. Okay, so the proof is in fact very short and very simple. Uh, since uh, A is a subset of B, then as soon as you get any uh, open interval cover of B, it is automatically an open interval cover of A, therefore the corresponding overestimate which is an overestimate of B, is also an overestimate of A. So that puts the set of overestimates of B as a subset of the set of overestimates of A. And then, whenever this is the case, the infimum over a bigger set uh, can always be smaller, right? Or could only be smaller. Uh, so that means M star of the infimum over this larger set is less than or equal to the infimum over the smaller set, which is M star of B, proof complete. Okay, so now that we know that monotonicity holds, then we are justified in finally saying this, right? So we know that M star of our interval is less than or equal to B minus A. How about the other side? Well, pretty natural trick. Uh, we do have to, you know, add a little onto A, subtract a little off of B, uh, in order to make sure that we really do have a closed bounded interval contained within I, but that's no problem, right? Just choose epsilon small enough for that to work. There must be uh, uh, some choice of epsilon, right? Easy enough to justify that there exists such an epsilon. When you know that, then you have that uh, for uh, 
every epsilon, right, for every positive epsilon, uh, you know, smaller than some threshold if you want, but, you know, the, the sort of like little nuances here are not hard to deal with. So we have that, um, that this holds for some positive epsilon and everything less than that epsilon and, uh, or every positive number less than that epsilon, blah, 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 whatever. Um, and so we have this inequality, right? That B minus A minus two epsilon is less than or equal to uh, M star of I. We can let epsilon go to zero since uh, this does not have epsilon in it. Then uh, the result of that limit is just B minus A less than or equal to m star of i. Putting these two together, we have the result. So there we have it. Uh, m star gets close, or sorry, gets all bounded intervals correct. So all that remains is to make the case for unbounded intervals. I'll uh, go ahead and show how it goes for this particular kind of unbounded interval, right, where it's bounded on the left but not on the right, and it is open on the left, but the, again, the generalization to all the other permutations here are extremely similar. And the idea is, again, that we're going to use monotonicity, right? I said it was going to be very, very useful, and it is. Um, so how are we going to use monotonicity? We're going to try to find sets inside of this that we can measure uh, that go to infinity, basically. Uh, so, right, so... Here's a set inside of it, uh, right? So this is a subset, this is a subset, this is a subset, right? They just keep getting bigger, length one, length two, length three. Since we know that um, that uh, the measure, right, the m star of this is equal to one, and using monotonicity, we get this inequality, right? So uh, from here, we get this inequality, right? And we find that m star of this interval is bigger than 2 and 3 and 4 and so on for all positive uh, integers, and that implies that uh, m star of this interval is infinity. The only number in the extended real numbers which is bigger than every integer. Or, uh, yeah. Okay. So we've proved that M star has a, you know, almost the most important property, which is that it gets intervals, right? That was, you know, in some sense, the most, uh, you know, important thing that was our motivating sort of uh, reason for having M star. But if it is going to be a reasonable measure, we want to make sure that it has other properties that we like you know, right, that we would expect a measure to have. One of them is that if you translate a set of real numbers, right, all you do is you slide it around, but you don't uh, scale it, deform it in any way, then the measure should not change. That's called translation invariance. So for any set of real numbers and any particular real number, the measure of A should equal the measure of lambda plus A, this is the translation, right? All it does is it takes every element of A and moves it by however much lambda is. So, uh, theorem uh, M star is translation invariant. The proof is pretty easy. I mean, especially when you are sort of equipped with the intuition that it's merely sliding the set around, well, you would expect that the set of overestimates of A would be exactly the same as the set of overestimates of lambda plus a, right? All you'd have to do is take, you know, whatever open interval cover you're talking about, slide it over, but it would have, ex right, every interval would have exactly the same length, and therefore the overestimate for, you know, by summing the lengths of those intervals together would be exactly the same. So that's what we prove. So, um, so take any element out of the set of overestimates of a. Now, um, because it is an overestimate, it must correspond to some open interval cover of A. Now, if you translate every interval by lambda, you now have, a, you know, right, this now forms an open interval cover of lambda plus A. It's easy to prove it, but if you, you know, uh, want to, you could say, well, look, I'm going to try to show that this is contained within the union over this. So give me any element out of here 
you know, lambda plus some like little a, call it, right, some element out of big A. Now just come back over here and say, all right, well, what, whatever that little a is, it's in one of these intervals. And then uh, you can argue that lambda plus that little a is contained in lambda plus whatever interval you found over here. I'm just, I'm going to leave this as a very hand wavy. It's very easy to prove. I've basically just sort of verbally sketched the proof. I'm not going to go into the details. Also, if you translate a, an interval, right, these are closed bounded intervals, but even if they weren't, if you just translate an interval, its length does not change. That is extremely easy to prove, given that you just have to realize that, like, if you, if you take lambda plus an interval, then it, you know, if, if the interval used to be a to b, now it's lambda plus a to lambda plus b, and then you take the difference of the endpoints. It's very easy, right? Okay, so now we're set to, to finish the proof, basically, or more or less. Um, this sigma that we originally selected, by definition, is the sum over the interval lengths that it corresponds to. And uh, as we've argued here, those lengths are exactly the same as these lengths. And the lambda plus ij's form an open interval cover of lambda plus i, so therefore, this is an overestimate of lambda plus a, and it, and it is the same thing as the original choice of uh, overestimate of a. So we've just shown set containment from the overestimates of a to the overestimates of lambda plus a. The reverse set containments are just as easy to prove, so I omit them. The sets are equal, and therefore the infimum over this set just is the infimum over that set, so m star of a is m star of lambda plus a.